Okay, Krista, we're officially recording. Okay, I'm gonna share it. Okay. Let's check our phones, Darren, and see if people are seeing us here. Yep. Uh, Mindy, Barbara, Benjamin. Benjamin, hi, good to see you. Mindy Garza, hello. All right. Barbara Boyd Doss, hello. All right. I'm going to turn my phone way down, Darren, and maybe put it on airplane mode for the moment. Okay. Can I turn mine the volume okay. all the way down? So we're just waiting for a minute for people to file into the virtual um, kitchen here. Okie doke. Krista, how are things going on your end? I've got it shared. So <laughs> that was my main concern. So. All right. Just wait. Well, let me check in up here really fast. Just a few more minutes. We have 10 people. Oh, great. Okay. Mary, can I see the phone? I don't know where it's at. Okay. Ken Johnson in the UK. Hello. Diana McIntyre, hello. Yay, Benjamin. Well, it's about right at noon, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Sure. Welcome to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. We love Norma Shearer here at Hollywood Kitchen, and this is the third time we've done a Norma Shearer recipe. And the first two did not quite live up to expectation. Mm -hmm. The oatmeal sticks were a bit of a misfire. If we're really honest, the pineapple sweet jello salad, disgusting. a hot mess, yeah. disgusting, disgusting, hot mess. So we're hoping the third time is going to be a charm where Norma Shearer is concerned. And as Danny Miller pointed out, no Norma Shearer stone is going to go unturned here at Hollywood Kitchen. <laughs> and I've been really eager to use this cookbook, by the way, a huge shout out to both Darren Barnes. I mean, um, Darren Barnes for being my special oh, guest yeah. and Crystal Lawler being my special guest too, which I'm so grateful to have two wonderful Norma Shearer experts. And also a shout out to Daryl Rooney and Marty Rafter for getting me this book. What Actors Eat When They Eat from 1939. This book is very rare. It's super hard to find. And when you do, it's usually two, $300. So I'm really psyched to have a, a copy. And this recipe we're gonna make today is called Chocolate Antoinette. And it's a kind of a tie-in, I presume, with the Marie Antoinette film that Norma Shearer starred in in 1938. Absolutely. So I thought we'd kind of talk about that film in, in particular today on the episode. Now, Darren has been collecting and researching Norma Shearer for decades. 30 years, yeah. 30 years. And we're going to look at some pieces from his collection. And Crystal Lawler has also been a very longtime Norma Shearer fan. And Krista, you run a Facebook page or a Facebook group for Norma. Uh, Norma Shearer Devotees. I founded it. It's a group on Facebook. And Darren's there and a lot of people are there. <laughs> yeah, I created one, but I think that's how we met each other is that we both had our own pages. So we just share back and forth. Yeah. And, yeah. I, uh, and, and we have a mutual friend in Mark Vieira. So he and I created yeah. the normashear.com website, which is a really, I think it's a pretty good go-to for oh, yeah. Norma information. I agree. I agree. And today yeah. also is Norma Shear and well, no, no, we're sure it's Tyrone Power Day on Summer Under the Stars on Turner Classic Movies. And I believe last night they showed Marie Antoinette. So I'm hoping maybe people will have DVR that or watched it on the TCM app so they can have it fresh in their minds. Mm -hmm. We were watching a little bit this morning. Yes, we were. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we uh, get started, I just want to ask each of you, out of all the films in Norma's career, what stands out to you about Marie Antoinette? So that's kind of gonna be the focus of our episode. Krista? What stands out to me is that it coincides with the fact that it, that was going on in her earlier roles. It was that she was a strong, independent woman, just like Marie Antoinette was. And, um, it also, um, what stood out to me about that role was um, just how, but she does it in every film, just 
her acting as a whole. I know it's her favorite film, but I just feel like it was very, um, it was natural almost for her to be that role, so. No, this, this, this is the pinnacle of her career for her. So, you know, there's always the women that came after this, which is probably the movie that she's the most remembered for. But as an individual actress without having to compete with any, you know, a vehicle that's just built for her, like this is, this is it. So, and it's been pretty much put together as being the pinnacle of, of her career and possibly the last film of her career. Although there's a lot of information I'm finding that there were still talks of a lot of other movies while Irving was alive that were going to be made after this. I think he just felt like this was going to be the ultimate picture for her. Yes. And, and she's fantastic in it. She looks beautiful. She's in, incredible in it. And she worked really hard on this film. What I like about this film is it's sort of the MGM machine at its absolute best because the costumes are so spectacular. The sets, just everything about this movie is first class, top of the line, extraordinary craftsmanship and every single level. And so watching it to me is definitely like a visual feast. Mm -hmm. Speaking of beast, all right, so we're gonna dive in quickly to make the chocolate Antoinette. Now, Darren has very graciously made this twice and we've kind of experimented with some different things. So we're gonna talk about the recipe and what you're gonna to need to make it. Yeah. So, so it's, it's actually, it's got a lot of ingredients to it, but it was actually a little easier than I thought it would be. And I know Krista made it as well. So, um, you know, I always start off by saying Norma didn't cook. Like, yeah. It's nay on the cooking. It, it, it's nay on the cooking. So anything complicated. And these recipes. <laughs> Things we have in common. <laughs> exactly. and, and these recipes, all, a lot of times, will have holes in them where they don't say how long you book things for, or it'll just say, you know, salt and flour. So it doesn't have ingredients. So this one is actually about as complete as you're going to get. Yeah, it even gives a cooking temperature and a cooking time, which I would give anything to have had that on other episodes. So that's kind of huge. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's pretty simple. You just start off, you have a, a double boiler, which people don't have anymore. So, uh, and a little trick that, we my, turn it that my grandmother used to do was, hot plate here. we got a hot plate for us. Yeah, I, that way it's, you can see it on camera can, better than the there we go. stove. Uh, so. It's just one pan inside of another pan with about an inch of water in the bottom pan. Or you can use a glass dish too, or I've you, done that Or you well. can use a glass dish. Yeah. Like it's just really easy to do. Uh, Carrie was talking about getting a, a double boiler. I'm like, your apartment's so small, do you really need one? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I don't, I don't. So uh, you just start off and it just says two egg yolks mm -hmm. and some milk. So uh, I've already separated the eggs. So you just put the oh. um, egg yolks in there. Hi, Carrie. Then, okay, not, we're not talking. And it calls for four cups of milk. So when I did this uh, last night, I just started off with a half a cup of milk. And that was pretty much just to get the egg yolk and the milk completely combined with each other. So this thing's going to bubble because the water is going, which is great. So you just mix the egg yolks until the milk are completely combined, which they just about are. And then the rest of it's pretty easy. It's just dumping the rest of the ingredients in there. So we love that. Yeah. So now it's like a nice golden yellow, which was uh, Norma's favorite color. Should I lift up the laptop yeah. so people can yeah, see the... you can see it. It's yep. just a, a nice, pretty yellow color. So, and that's just yolks and milk. And then uh, add the additional milk, which is three and a half cups. I have another thing of milk out here. I wasn't sure if we had enough, so. And Carrie was kind enough to bring this hot plate over because doing it on the stove, I would have my back to you the entire time. Yeah, this hot plate, I found so much use out of this hot plate. It's kind of amazing. They're great to have. Yeah, and especially when you're doing a demonstration like this, because that way I I tried to mount my laptop over my stove, which nearly ended in total disaster. So <laughs> it's been kind of huge. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then four, four tablespoons of tapioca, which I know Krista had trouble finding. It took me two stores to find it. And um, which I was reading on the box, you actually have to shake the box of tapioca too, because I guess tapioca has, I'm not sure what the two ingredients are, but it kind of separates. So the, the mm -hmm. tapioca actually soaks to the bottom. So you do uh, four tablespoons of tapioca. Okay. Yep. All right, I'm gonna stir this. Here you can stir that. And then a half a cup of sugar. 
We tried to, Darren tried to make one version of this with a, a full cup of sugar instead of a half, but the results were super, super rich. So really you rich. decided to go to stay with the original recipe, which was a half cup. Yeah. It, it was good, but it was just really rich. Okay, and how much vanilla did it take? Uh, and the vanilla is um, one. Oh, oh, no, we'll basically just do a cap. Okay. Which is probably a little much, but I always feel like you can never have enough vanilla. Yes, I love vanilla. Yeah. So it's a half a cup of sugar, a quarter teaspoon of salt, which I already dumped in there, and then four squares of unsweetened chocolate, and then two teaspoons of vanilla. Or, um, I used right. semi-sweet and didn't have to use as much sugar. Exactly. Oh, and, that's a good way to go. And for the chocolate, like yeah. I try to break it up a little bit more and you can, but you don't really need to because it does just melt down. Mm -hmm. And Darren got Ghirardelli chocolate, which I think is uh, very much in line with Marie Antoinette. Absolutely. Wishes, perhaps. <laughs> go big or go home. That's right, that's <laughs> right. So, you know, this recipe was part of the PR blitz for Marie Antoinette. And if there's ever a film to use an example at MGM for every bit of PR blitz that they can do, it would be this film. There were, you know, tie-ins like crazy. I have um, a Marie Antoinette uh, handkerchief that would come in this box that looked like it was a, a vintage box. With a, it? Yeah, I'll show it to you. And, and it um, has a letter in it from the... Uh, I think it was the Chinese, um, the Chinese uh, artist who actually did the embroidery on it. And they were mass produced, but they really, they went insane. There was figurines and, you know, they really couldn't do much with hairstyles because of the powdered wigs, but just anywhere and everywhere that this movie could be promoted, they did. And, you know, these recipes were just part of promoting the, the, the machine. Nine times out of 10, these talent didn't cook, or if they did cook, they didn't cook these things. So it was yeah. just getting it out there, but yeah, the, the blitz around this movie was insane. It was like radio ads and you know, just billboards. And they had a, a, a huge, huge LA premiere, which if, you, if you've got the, the DVD for this movie, or if you've seen it on TCM. It's or, on YouTube as well. Yeah, it's on YouTube. It is- like, Hollywood Goes to Town, I think is what they call it. Yeah, I mean, I mean they recreated parts of Versailles going up San Vicente, like all the way into the theater. No expense was spared. I mean, in the video, you can see the gardeners working on the garden just for this premiere for one mm -hmm. night. I mean, it's really astounding. Yeah, so it, it goes to show for, you know, things that maybe said negatively about this movie, what the studio felt about it at the time. And this was gonna be a really, really big movie. And I know uh, Carrie was asking us about it yesterday, if they'd ever considered doing this in color. and. No, you know, there's just nothing anywhere. You know, people we've talked to, experts we've talked to, uh, we wish it had been filmed in color, but there was never serious talk about the color because this was a, almost a $3 million movie in 1938. Which, what would that adjust to for inflation today? Oh, God. Oh them. my goodness. Yeah, Anyone have an inflation calendar? Please leave it in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because a few years back, uh, Mark Vieira wrote this fantastic Irving Thalberg biography, and the Academy did a huge exhibition of Thalberg and his career at MGM and everything. And they had some costumes from Marie Antoinette, and the color and the embroidery and the details were astounding. And I remember just thinking, oh my God, it's just such a shame this wasn't in color because of all the work that went into yeah. these costumes. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the, the weird things that I've come across that they did were, were they had uh, marionettes made of Norma and uh, all the characters in the movie. And mm -hmm. there was, they created all, all of Norma's gowns from the movie and had her interact with Tyrone Power and with Robert Morley and, with, and uh, John Barrymore and everybody. So they had a, a bus that they drove across country and they would set it up in front of movie theaters and they would do a marionette show recreating scenes from Marie Antoinette. So, now, don't quote me on this, but wasn't the Marie Antoinette Robert Morley's first film? Yeah, this first American film. I know, uh, you know, in his bi mm -hmm. autobiography, he said he got here. It was a huge, big production. He might have said overblown. 
but he basically just got in and out and went like back to England and then sort of started his career over again because it was just such a huge film. But he, he received very good reviews for it. I think it was a, a good platform to be a first American film for anybody. Oh, for sure, for sure. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to think of some of the other crazy, crazy things they did. I and mean, they just did so such a blitz of publicity on this film. It was insane. Well, you know what's interesting, too, though, is in light of historic context after World War II and the U.S. involvement in World War II, you wouldn't have seen a premiere this lavish. You would not have seen a promotional campaign, I don't think, on this level, because that would that would have looked really vulgar yeah. after that. You know? Yeah. Well, that and, wouldn't have... and this was... You had this, and then you had Gone with the Wind, you know, which was, uh, was it December of 39? So that's like at the end of the next year. And by September 39, uh, you know, Poland had fallen, you know, Europe was, everybody knew the war was coming. So I think after this film, and, you know, there was a couple of big, um, like Errol Flynn Western ones that they did, did a couple of big premieres in, in 1940. But by that 1940, like the, the big premiere days were over. And I don't think they ever got Quite back to that. Even you know, Judy Garland Stars Born, it was huge, but they didn't really do anything you know, outrageous. They, they didn't try to read yeah. it home in front of the theater or anything crazy. Yeah. 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 Okay. And in terms of Academy Award nominations, Norma shared this was her fifth and final Academy Award nomination, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. and was it nominated in other categories? Because I seem to think that it got like art direction, uh, supporting actor. It was, right? and that was one of the things I was going to look at. This is taking a while to thicken, by the way. So a lot of stirring involved here. Aaron, I'll give it a Google. Oh, will you? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> like, I know we know who ended up winning, though, thanks to Carrie. Yeah, it's boiling over <laughs> a little bit. Sorry. OK. Um, Oh, it keeps flying out of the pan. I know. Okay, we'll just, yeah. you know, we'll just we'll go just, hurt and just pop it out. out. Yeah, we'll just, well, the water is bubbling over, so. Oh, the oh, that's what's causing. Oh, it's not that. Yeah, it's, it's the water is bubbling. Over. That's why you got to keep it stirring too. Okay, I'll I'll keep stirring. But yeah, just slowly. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll I mean, stir more slowly. I mean, the ultimate budget was two point nine million dollars for this thing, which was huge. Is anyone in the comments? Has anyone posted uh, the inflation? Like what that would be today's inflation yeah. calculator. Oh yes. Uh, so Benjamin asked me, uh, please tell about the party where Norma attended in the Marie Antoinette costume and couldn't make it through the door. Yes, so yes. That, first, first. First. Yeah. So a uh, way around the first was having a um, basically like a chuck wagon. Uh, early American party at uh, Marion Davies' home, which was just a like three or four houses away from Norma's um, home at that point. And when she started prepping for Marie Antoinette, she would take the costumes home and she would wear them around the house because she wanted to feel completely comfortable. And she wanted to look on screen like she had been raised in these dresses and knew how to move around in these skirts and knew how to you know, really just go through her day to day and not look affected on the screen. So Hearst and Marion were having this party. So she um, decided that she was gonna show up as Marie Antoinette. And her justification was, the French were very helpful to the pioneers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that went over well with uh, the Hearst uh, crowd. But, but uh, Marion wasn't photographed with her, but Hearst came out. There's a picture of him kissing her hand, a picture of her kneeling down, a picture of him, uh, her kneeling down, and then a picture of him bowing to him. So, you know, the lore was is that he was so angry, he refused to have his picture taken with her. But I, I kind of feel, as I've read many times, uh, with Norma, um, she's known for being very quirky. And even Marion told Irving Thalberg, at a, or was it Irving told Marion, which is in her book, where, you know, Norma's wonderful, but she's got something just a little funny back there. Because she would just mm -hmm. do these little crazy episode things. So she justified it. She showed up. She was Marie Antoinette. Don't know how long she stayed at the party. You know, all the <laughs> art. And, and, I, and I've never actually seen photos of her inside the party, only at the door with her. So there's the whole lore about them having to take the doors off for her to get in. But you could imagine if they can take the carousel from the Santa Monica Pier apart and put it back together in Marion's ballroom, that Norma's Marie Antoinette dress would, Not a problem. would be able to fit through the doorway. So there's, there's a lot of myths around it, but it, it really did happen and the photos are there to prove it. But I think Hearst embraced it. Marion was probably, if anything, annoyed at the most, but I, you know, she just, Marion seemed like she just rolled with everything anyway. 
Well, in Mark mm-hmm. Vieira's uh, biography of Thalberg, he talks about how that uh, Marion Davies wanted to play Marie Antoinette and that that was really what she wanted and that that was one of the sticking points of why they left MGM and set up shop at Warner Brothers. Is that, uh, is that your uh, finding as well? Um, yeah, I mean, she, they wanted Barrett's and Whirlpool Street first, you know, and, and Marion was, from everything I've read, including her own, her own writing, she wanted to be a comedian. She was fine being a comedian. She didn't want to do this heavy drama stuff. And Hearst just wanted her to be something that she was. And as we know from show people and all those great, great silence and yes. even her early talkies, like she's adorable mm-hmm. and wonderful. And she did a movie called Going Hollywood where they tried to make her into like a Jean Harlow and it just didn't work. And, you know, he, he tried to push her in all these different directions and she would do it, you know, for WR, but she didn't really want to do it. So they, they did a screen test for uh, Barrett's Wimple Street. Mm-hmm. that um i forgot who it was it was like a needle loose one of those famous writers came out and said yes this isn't gonna happen uh so norman did that and it was pretty much after that uh and and then after um uh, wr tried to go after uh marie antoinette and that's when he was having money problems so mayor said fine if you pay for half the movie so you know and and hearse is like i've done so much for you you know it's you know, they'd had a long history with each other. So that's when they just pulled up stakes and moved over to Warner Brothers. So I think Marion was just sort of cro- caught in the crossfire of it. And WR just had ideas of what he wanted Marion to be and what he wanted her to do. But that, you know, I don't, I don't think it really mattered to her. It's like he wanted her to be this great dramatic actress. And she just, that wasn't her at all. She was so incredibly funny. And yeah, I agree. It's like he wanted her to be someone she wasn't. Yeah, you know, it actually was nominated uh, for three Oscars, uh, four Oscars, music, art direction, actor in a supporting role, Robert Morley, and actress, and it did not win anything. Well, that was also the year Betty Davis won for Jezebel. Yes. Yep. Right? Okay. Well, that was an unstoppable uh, yeah, that force was an unstoppable, of nature right yeah. there. Yeah, and, you know, even reading in the papers at the time, um, by 38, 39, and 40, even the newspapers and the columnists were kind of like, hey, you know, from the silent days, we still have Norma, we still have Joan, we still have, you know, two or three other people, and everybody else is kind of gone, and maybe it's time for those folks to sort of step aside, which is, it's pretty brutal that they're talking about their ages when they're that young, just because they'd come out of silence. So, and I, and I know from, uh, you know, experience like Mary Carlisle, who I knew, who started mm-hmm. at MGM in 1929, I, uh, there's a silent that's listed on her credits. And I asked her and I said, um, so, you know, did you ever do a silent picture? And she's like, I never did a silent. She got just absolutely indignant about it. So I think actually having that stigma of being in silence, unless maybe you were like a Myrna Loy, you were, you know, a, a chorus girl or, you know, smaller, you know, you could have started in silence that way, but if you were a star in silence, it's sort of that Norma Desmond thing. You know, it's like, you, you know, you're that old and it's, it's like eight years before Bad. that. Well, Marlena Dietrich always said she never made silence and there's absolute proof that she did. In fact, I saw one of her starring silent film roles in San Francisco at the San Francisco silent. Yeah, I think people thought that it showed their age and I think Hollywood has always been about the next thing. Oh yeah. And I think when sound came in, as the line says in the, that film, the artist, out with the old and in with the new. Mm-hmm. And I think the new hot hip now thing was sound and anything before that was just so passe and so kind of ridiculed and that's unfortunate silence are an incredible art form and it it saddens me that people didn't appreciate it for such a long time i love her voice she just transitioned so well i just it's one of those unmistakable voices like my family knows when i'm watching a norma film because they know her voice i just i do they had a commercial on TCM this week for showing Marie Antoinette that when Janet Lee was talking about her and yeah. I agree with her so much about loving her voice. I just love hearing her talk. Yeah. You know, I've got something really cool to show you while talking about that. You go ahead. Krista, do you want to okay. show us something from your collection while Darren's getting a... Sure. It's not half as good as his, but uh, I could do that. Here's my one of my Norma pictures of her in her gown. Oh, that's great. And it certainly shows off the costume too. Yes, I, d- I couldn't walk <laughs> if I was her. And then I got out some of my Norma and Tyrone pictures because of oh. it, him being today. Such uh, a beautiful shot. 
Let's talk about Norma and Tyrone because Tyrone obviously was under contract with Fox. Yes. And he was borrowed by MGM for this film. Yeah. Uh, how did he and Norma get along during the making of this? Everything I've read, he, they really liked each other. You know, people asked him, you know, if they slept together, you know, innuendos were said. And, you know, he's a, a pretty and younger man on her shoulders or on her arm. And, you know, after Irving died, she went through that sort of crazy uh, Mary Widow phase. And yeah. I get it, you know, she, she was 26 when she got married and was married for nine years and had two kids. So she's 35. She's one of the biggest movie stars in the world. She's gorgeous. It's like, go have a good time. So, and yeah. I, I have a feeling a lot of these actors, they would fall in love with each other during a movie. You know, they probably have sex. They would have their in the moment affairs and then be done. And, and I think Tyrone was kind of offended sometimes when people would try to make it a little more salacious than it was. Right. And I know that Annabella, his first wife, he didn't meet her until 1939. Yeah. So it would have been, his first marriage would have been after. Yeah. And he, was, and he was dating, uh, you know, Sonia Henney and just like everybody. So he was mm -hmm. all over the place. So, you know, good for Norma, you know, and, mm -hmm. and she wanted him. And I think she, he was dating Annabella, but she insisted mm -hmm. on having him on her arm to like do the photo op for the, uh, for the film. And I'm like, I, I would have too. Like I absolutely you yeah. know, I get why she wanted to do it. So um, this is one of the, the coolest things I've ever come across. So uh, when you were talking about how Norma's voice is is so incredible, so I love um, yeah, so, then, <laughs> that's um, my favorite thing about her. The, voice. I, she has a great voice, and they just you know they roll their R's, and everything is boulevard, mm -hmm. and they have that very mid Atlantic way of speaking. So um, uh, of course, you Collins is a friend of mine, and she was at MGM in thirty two for about five years and made. 60, 70 films. So she was telling me about this book and I had read about these a little bit here and there. So it's a thing that's called a, a, a linguist book that these uh, folks would come from back East and they would, you know, they, they were out here sort of training all of these untrained actors, how to roll their R's into these round things. tones. Round tones. Round tones. Singing in yep. the rain. Oh yeah. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so this says, property of Clyde Collins, which was her mother. So every day, Corsu had to do this book from the beginning. And it was bro, bra, bree, bree, bro, brew, bra. And it goes on <laughs> and on and on. And she oh, would have to do nice. back and front. Can you show every... that to the camera? This is really so, amazing. So if you can kind of see it. So, yeah. and it's these tongue twisters that go on forever. And then the white snow world everywhere. The wheezy old sailor had white whiskers. Where did Will Wheeler buy the? Oh wheel? wow! And it just and and this poor little girl, starting at three years old, would have to do this book from beginning to get end every day to train oh, her yes. tongue. Oh, so even at three years old, she had that same mid Atlantic sort of you know rolling of the tones. And you know you hear these ladies interviewed in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, and they still sound like they're. British aristocracy, you know, they're, they're amazing. And it came from these books. So when they, they were considered done with their training, it would be a rite of passage for them to burn their book. So the actresses would get together and they would burn their linguist book and course who kept hers. So it's the only wow. one that I've ever seen before. Oh my gosh, can I, can we take like a picture and put just a page of that on the hollywoodkitchenshow.com oh, blog? Absolutely. Because that is fascinating yeah. stuff. And if you sit down and you do a page of this thing, like your tongue will be sore. Like you just cannot speak. Wow. It's like here, near, near, dear, dear, dear. And it just goes on and on. So when I- when Any Moses supposes? Moses, <laughs> Moses supposes. This is getting really thick, by the way. Yeah, it so took a lot of stirring, but it is getting there. Yeah, let me put this away. So we are, nice and thick. So we are good with that. So I think we are good with yeah, the you thick. Just, you want to turn that off? Yeah, we're going to turn the burner off. Right, okay. okay. All right. And Darren, very wisely, when we were doing our rehearsal, if anyone makes this with us or decides to make it, a casserole dish is key because if you tried to put this on a cookie sheet as it's... Oh, shit. Oh, jeez. Oh, shit. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I if you try to put this on a casserole <laughs> sheet or a cookie sheet, rather, it would just go all <laughs> over the place and make a huge mess. Yeah. So, Darren oh. very, very wisely suggested the casserole dish, which is a terrific idea. And that's, this is what I was trying to avoid. Sorry. Oh, gosh. I know. I it's okay. To... It's just hot water. Yeah. <laughs> I just God. didn't expect it to 
Like, like do that. spew all over here. the place. <laughs> and I will move this back over here and we are done with the hot plate. We're done with the hot plate. Yay. Nice. Okay. I would die if we spilt like hot plate yeah. or pudding on your book there. That would be bad. Are you okay, Carrie? That's why I, I oh, yeah, I'm okay. That's why I rent. She's <laughs> my work head. So you just pour it into a greased uh, casserole dish. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a, a good thick pudding. Like we actually, yeah. Got, I think we got mm -hmm. the mixture right. It took a bit of stirring, enough. but yeah. I think we we got there. Yeah, because it says to do it for about fifteen minutes. Yep. I know. I know. I know. I should be doing this sort of this way, but you guys okay. get the gist. It's two percent. Get the gist. The pudding goes in first. Let me see if I can put the camera over it so you can yeah, see. Yeah, so you can see, mm -hmm. and it's like a nice, rich, uh, like a thick mousse. Ooh, yeah, nice. and it smells really good too. Uh, Wish yeah. you could smell it, but. So except for a bubbling water. Yeah. So then on top of this, you're gonna put a, um, a meringue. Yes, the meringue. So, which is just your egg whites and you're gonna fold in sugar. So I'm going to run and should I do that in the room real quick? And yeah, if you want to, if you so, want to. So I'm going to run and do that while you guys okay. talk. And Chris, okay. you go. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Um, Darren is going to go in the other room because the mixer makes a lot of noise. And so oh, yeah. we can mix the meringue in the next room. So um, okay. yeah, that book is fascinating, right? That book is super fascinating. <laughs> but she had a great voice, but definitely. Yeah, I agree. It had to have been really stressful too for a lot of the silent film stars because sound is such a completely different medium. And then the will they or will they not make that transition, you know? And uh, that had to be really a stressful, nerve wracking time for so many people whose futures were kind of hanging in the mm -hmm. balance at that time. For sure. I mean, the head of the sound is her brother. So. <laughs> well, that had to help, I'm, I'm sure. That had to help. <laughs> <laughs> and Douglas Shear won multiple Academy Awards for his sound work and had a very, mm -hmm. very long career in his own right. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Definitely. So do you oh. have any other uh, Norma Shear items you can show us while Darren's mixing? Yeah. This is my other, I just got the Norma and Tyrone out since he was today on TCM. But Definitely. There, I have that one. Oh, and good. here we are. Hold on a minute. I have this. I'm sure that my photo keeps falling because I'm grabbing more stuff. Hold on a minute. I'll put this down for a second. Okay. That's so good. I just kind of want to. Here is my it. silver screen. It's still wrapped. I keep them wrapped. Oh, wow. But, uh, it's for silver screen promotion. Um, October 38th. Okay. And. And. I just love classic movie magazines. I think the art in them and on the covers is okay. so beautiful. What I like about the Norma Shear devotees, you can kind of like uh, the other people that are in there, it's kind of neat what they have because they have something that you don't, you know what I mean? So it's wow. like kind of neat, but here's my picture play of her. Promoting. Oh, that's a gorgeous cover. It is super pretty, 38, um, I believe. Yeah, it was September 38 and wait a minute i gotta get my lobby card and out. as we know a lot of these movies did not they were not released like they released films today where day and date it goes to like four thousand theaters around america like back then it would right. start in say new york la right and kind of wind its way you know around the country okay this is the one that darren was picking on me on about them calling marie antoinetta but it's my Spanish lobby card. Oh, that is gorgeous. I love looking at the foreign markets and the kind of posters they did because I find those sometimes even far superior than the American. Yeah, the Spanish version ones, they're just so full of color. They like pop. Oh, yeah, that's um, a real find. Krista, where'd you find that one out? Um, I actually, um, I'm trying to remember where I got it. Um, I believe it was from a local dealer in Chicago area. Oh, so cool. yeah he kind of knows some of the places because he's here darren's around here all the time as well but next time he needs to come see me <laughs> i think this last trip he made was a really fast one but yeah um it's kind of amazing what you can turn up sometimes 
And mm-hmm. I, I've, I've told Darren this story. Uh, several years ago, I was visiting my family in Georgia and I saw, a, I was in an antique store and I see Norma Shearer's picture across the store. And naturally I just made a beeline for it. And I picked it up and it was, oh, here's the meringue. Okay. And it was a home book someone had made in the early 1930s of mom here photos. And I texted Darren and he texted back, there's stuff in here I've never seen. And I bought it for $10 in the antique store and shipped it out to Darren. I was too afraid to travel across the country with it because it was real fragile, you know? And I didn't get it smushed up in my suitcase. So I like boxed it up and shipped it to Darren like the next day on FedEx. So um, oh, yeah. but it was so cool to find something like that. I, I love sure. those scrapbooks because I've got so much information and seen photos in them that I'd still never seen to this day. And I, you know, and I've got friends that are like Daryl who are hardcore Gene Harlow collectors. And we just know that we're never going to- Oh, I love when he shares his goodies. Yeah, we're never going to have it all and we're <laughs> always going to keep finding it. There were things that were exclusive for magazines or just limited or mm-hmm. just haven't survived so um Definitely. you know scrapbooks are I, I have boxes of of scrapbooks and things that just have mentions in so i just i, I whipped the meringue up until it peaked i folded mm-hmm. in four tablespoons of sugar and then carrie and i both really like coconut right yeah we like so, coconut i know you're not i went stands coconut well, so. i really like it chris does not it's not her thing but yeah uh, so you just sprinkle the coconut around the top this actually looks it's, it took me three times to finally get it to where it's looking like what it's supposed to look like. And then you just bake it for 15 minutes or until delicately brown. So we're going to stick this into the oven and then look at more memorabilia. Absolutely. And we might even eat some on camera just to show you how delicious it is. We might. I've got the one I made last night. Excellent. That looks really good. Darren did a terrific oh, job. A yeah. So take a picture with, where's my phone? Okay. Take a picture of this one and it will be posted on the blog. So you can see what it looks like. Yes, absolutely. This is the lightest, fluffiest one so far. I guess it does take a few times to do it. Yeah, a lot of these recipes, I find that it takes me and or my guest or both of us like two or three tries before we really get it like where it should be. Yeah, and we're just not cooks, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning as I go along. Ignore that. So, there yeah. you go. Yeah, Christina, I'm actually coming over right after this and bringing this to you, which there's another thing. I'm going to grab some photos real quick. By the way, Christina Rice, uh, she is our Anne Dvorak and Jane Russell expert. So she, too, will be sampling some of this delicacy this afternoon. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm making sure we didn't miss any questions. Uh, That used to lose exercise. Yeah, Leslie, you had a vocal coach in high school that used to do linguist vocal exercises. Yeah, it's all about the enunciation, like Eve Arden. Well, I, I love that. So, um, well, I met Christina Rice about 25 years ago, and I'd been collecting on Norma at that point for five or six years. And uh, uh, I said, why don't you come over to the house? I'll show you my collection. So she walks in. I've got a wall of these photos up. And I'd never really thought like a whole lot about it, but it's a whole like 11 by 14 Marie Antoinette collection yeah. and I had 19 of these things and I was like yeah those are cool and she get was, closer to the yeah. camera and so the glare and, is and she was literally like are you kidding so mm-hmm. uh, I used to run an ad in a thing called the MCW before we had um you know eBay and I would go to the paper shows and this woman wrote me a letter and I will I just ran it perpetually for like 10 years just saying if you know if anybody's got any Norma Shear stuff I want to buy it so this woman wrote me a letter and said hey my husband was a bus driver at MGM in the 30s and he brought these photos home and I've had them ever since so this was like 50 years later um, would you be interested and I'm like well yeah I'm a college student I'm poor how much do you want for them and she said ten dollars each so wow yeah, so I, I got this huge collection. I think I got 27, if I remember right, that are all like double weight stamped Laszlo Willingers from this one lady whose husband was a bus driver at MGM. And I like it, and I again I just didn't think much about it. And then Christina was like, Are you freaking kidding me? I'm like, Whoa, okay. <laughs> That's what I mean about this stuff turning up in unlikely places. Yeah. You know? Like it just it it pops up anywhere and everywhere. So then uh, the woman also had a box of eight by tens and she said she had lots of the eight by tens. And um I graduated college, I moved 
and I didn't contact her for like a year or two. So I wrote her a letter and I said, hey, you know, because I, I had bought these over a period of time, you know, I'd, I'd buy like three or four at a time from her. Um, I said, I'm ready to buy those eight by tens. And she wanted eight dollars each for those. And she goes, oh, I didn't know you wanted them. I hadn't heard from you. So I just threw them away. <gasps> yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, my God, that kills me. Yeah. So. Oh, pretty, no. I know. So pretty crazy stuff. Wow. One thing I wanted to talk about about Marie Antoinette was the lavishness of the wigs and yes. what they had to do to Norma's hairline and everything to get those wigs because they look enormous. They're super platinum blonde, mm -hmm. and it looks. I, I assume they have to all be wigs because oh, yeah. your real hair that would be a nightmare. How how did they get those wigs on her and what what was involved in that process? Well, uh, Max Factor designed them. So um, and. Oddly enough, last year during COVID, uh, a woman on eBay had a bunch of photos that were in gym stuff. And I wrote her and I'm like, hey, well, you know, what are these? Where did you get them? Blah, blah. She said that she got them from uh, a storage unit that had been let go. And we started this whole correspondence. I identified a couple of the photos. She made a killing on the ones that I identified. So she just gave me everything that was left. So in, in this stuff, her husband's stepfather had been William Grimes, the one of the uh, photographers at MGM. And it was all the negatives of him shooting all the behind the scenes stuff of them designing the wigs, the jewelry, everything uh -huh. at MGM, all, all the original and have eight by 10 negatives and uh, like four by five negatives. So I spent like three weeks scanning these things in and they would have, they, they brought in uh, Norma's usual hairdresser. They would bring in teams and they would actually teach them how to do these wigs. So they would have big lessons. So there's actually classrooms where there's big boards with like drawings of wigs and they all have wig stands in front of them and they're going through and they're practicing all the wigs. Because you imagine on, on hundreds and hundreds of extras. So having to crank that out too and to keep them on par with the leads. And again, they got to look good, but not as good as Norma and Gladys George and the rest of them. So uh, going through this archive has been pretty incredible. And I found a couple of corresponding articles about you know some of the names of the people. Uh, there was one woman who was brought in, she was an illustrator just to design jewelry. So yeah, so she there's pictures of her, you know, and these people look like they're going to a party. You know, that's the great thing about the 30s is this woman sitting there like 14 hours a day slaving and she's wearing like a, a gorgeous blue suit, her hair and makeup completely done, yet she's sweating and slaving, like doing all these drawings. So it, it, it was a huge, huge undertaking. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think, you know, part of when MGM did it too is they're, they're just like any other studio, they're all about reuse. So they knew they had other movies coming down the pipeline, like Sweethearts and New Moon, and especially the Jeanette McDonald stuff, that they were going to reuse this stuff. So it's, you know, the initial cost that's charged to Marie Antoinette, but it, it wasn't like we're going to make this one period picture and, and, it's then, over and then be stuck with thousands of costumes. And they also, you know, they did get stuff from Western Costume and borrowed things from other studios. Like they would reach out and do it. But it, it was huge, huge pre-production and uh, I mean, I, I, I pulled an article on it because um, Norman Irving had gone on vacation in 1933. And in February of 1934, they announced that this was going to be her follow up film to Barrett's Wimple Street. So which would have been in, you know, the end of 34, 35 uh, and that um, Charles Lawton was going to play the king. Which oh, I, thought, that, I remember. I remember you telling me that. Yeah, And that's been, you know, spoken about a lot. But. The pre-production was so massive on this that it just kept getting pushed and getting pushed and getting pushed. And then it finally got pushed to, you know, after Irving's death, which was uh, September of 36. So, and then Norma had to negotiate with the studio to, you know, get the contract back. And then uh, they, they started principal photography Christmas, 1937. So, and I've got, um, oddly enough, which I found on eBay a couple of years ago, uh, Norma's makeup artist, because Sidney Gilleroff and Jack Don were the heads of the department, but each actress was assigned their own team and they would stay with them for years. So I've got pictures with the same, Norma with the same hairdresser for like 12 years and Joan Crawford and Hedy Lamarr, they would get, you know, these same, uh, same teams. They were uh, generally, men were makeup, women were hair, oddly enough. And, you know, it would flip flop around a little bit. Uh, but yeah. Um, you know, just huge, huge undertaking for them. What I wonder is how you hold your head up, because I assume those wigs weighed a tremendous yeah, amount. Like, sure. how do you kind of keep your head held up in any way when you've got 
I don't know how many pounds on your head. That, that's why Norma um, would take them home and practice with them. You know, she wanted to, I think, build up those weird muscles that you'd probably need in your shoulders to hold, you know, 16 pounds on your head. And a, a lot of the wigs they actually show them on scales how much they weigh. And there was one in there that weighed 16 pounds. Oh my God. So, you, and you can imagine like it's that angle having to go up. And, and they were ready. And oh, that's what we were starting with. Uh, so with Norma, yeah, when she went to the Tailwaggers Ball, and there's another event too where she wears bangs. They did clip-on bangs because they jacked up her hairline so much. Because you figure you're putting up to 16 pounds on someone's head and then gluing it to this that fine mm -hmm. skin that's like the crown of your head. Mm -hmm. So it just made her raw all, all across the front. And I think it's honestly why she opted out of never doing another period film. You know, she you know, Pride and Prejudice, there's a couple other period films that were slated to be her movies. And I think just this, the sheer pre-production and opulence and having to deal with so much, like, she's like, I'll, I'll just do a nice comedy and have my real hair. Right. Yeah, and you know, even Idiot's Delight, you know, she, she, did, she did wear a wig for that one, but it had bangs and it didn't weigh 16 pounds. So they could pretty much just put a wig cap on it and throw on it and she'd be fine. But I think it's just, when it comes to the ringlets and the curls and the weight and just everything that goes along with it, I'd imagine, you know, she doesn't need to do it. But, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Marie, Marie Antoinette was her, her favorite film, is what she always said. And uh, I think Gavin Lambert mentions that, you know, she only had two 16 millimeter prints in her private collection, which is Romeo and Juliet and uh, Marie Antoinette which were the closest to her heart. Uh, I know when they had an auction a couple of years ago, there was a print of Romeo and Juliet, but I didn't see one of Marie Antoinette. Oh, wow. Yeah, but she she kept everything about this film and always raved about this film. And, you know, uh, she got so exhausted by March of 38, February, March of 38, that they actually gave her three weeks off just from, you know, the, the sheer volume of having to do this. And they had the rest, all the, the B unit stuff shooting. And, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on that she's not in, but, and, and I love for her three weeks to relax and to get back in shape. She went skiing. Like, <laughs> I know, skiing. Or like, of what's going to happen later. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, you went skiing, but it's like, wouldn't you just want to go sit by a beach and read a book and actually relax for three weeks? But skiing for her was relaxing. So. Maybe she was in a chalet relaxing by the fire after a day of skiing. So. Oh, I'm sure she was, yeah. Well, one another thing I want to talk about, about an aspect of this film, is the director, because I was watching it again on TCM the other night, and Alicia Malone made a great point in that W.S. Van Dyke, one take Woody, as he was known, seemed like an odd choice for a very finely crafted epic period piece. So, and then I noticed that it gives a special thank you to Sidney Franklin, her frequent director, in the credits. So if you guys could talk about what happened with that. Yeah, Krista and I talked about it when we were doing the, the test. Of, so Sydney was always intended to be the director and he and Irving had uh, collaborated on this a lot. And that, that when they started in 34, it was always announced that Sydney was gonna be the director and that was Norma's favorite director. He was the most, I think, pliable director. He was very much of a company man. Like, yeah, they were very, very much riding high. Norma could also boss Sydney around a little bit. You know, he would, <laughs> he, she always felt she was better on the 20th take than she was on the first take. And a lot of directors, they'd get the third or fourth take and be like, you're fine. It's like, no, and, and she would go and go and go. And directors even wrote, she actually did get better, which was really rare for an actress. So mm -hmm. uh, when they, they came down to like the night before this, and I think it had a, it was like a hundred day shooting schedule or something crazy or 110 days, so some huge amount. And Louis B. Mayer, which I, I know it was a bit of a, um, him throwing his weight around too, uh, was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna let this whole circus right. just get out, get out of my hands. So the night before he went to Sydney Franklin and said, I want you to do this picture in like 70 days. And Sydney's like, I can't do it. And you know, the amount of days that you're offering. And he said, well, you know, I've, I've talked it over with Norma and we're gonna replace you. And he didn't call Norma. He didn't do anything with Norma. He just went off, sort of licked his wounds. And they brought in W.S. Van Dyke the next day, who did give the film an, a good energy. You know, and I do have to say, watching Barrett's and Wimple Street and the other films that she did with Sidney Franklin, they're very slow. They're very delicate. And mm -hmm. Marie Antoinette could have been a much slower, a little more delicate, little, you know, drawing roomish kind of a thing so uh, you know W.S. Van Dyke definitely did, it, I don't think it has the heart so much that it could have with Sydney but it definitely has the movement 
Mm -hmm. And they did in the 50s, finally, um, I think Sidney Franklin wrote Norma a letter and and they finally cleared the air because Norma said she wasn't aware of it, that she said that she showed up and that Mayor said he's being replaced and Sidney's fine with that. Not not saying that Mayor said that Norma was fine with that. So they, they pulled a fast one on her. And, you know, this budget was huge. You know, he uh, Mayor just wanted to get this thing done. Hmm. So, and it was a holdover from Irving. So everything that Irving had in pre-production was handed to other producers. So this one was handed to one of Irving's favorite producers, but was still very much of an Irving project. So I think the distance that Mayor probably wanted to get from Irving, you know, he, he, he got it after this one. It was like that, yeah. that whole team just sort of dissipated. So, wow. so somebody asked, uh, did Norma keep stuff from her movies? Um, oddly enough, uh, the contemporary clothes, and she writes over and over and over in her autobiography and in letters and notes and um, interviews that, you know, she's not allowed to, but that if she wanted to keep the clothes, she'd have to buy them, but they were really expensive. But like right after she did A Free Soul, she and Irving went to Europe and she wore her entire uh, wardrobe on that trip. I would have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're custom made. Right, they're, they're beautiful right, clothes. Adrian, yeah. yeah um, you know, all the way up till like 1940, I have her at a dinner party wearing one of those crazy outfits from Idiot's Delight. So I think because she was Norma and it might've been one of those little things back there, I think they all that stuff just sort of walked its way home and nothing was ever really said to her. But when it came to props, I, I've never heard or read or seen anything where she kept any sort of props. Uh, I know there was the ring. Every everything leads me to the. I want it. I yeah, know. that's like my coveted. Some want yeah. the. I want that ring. <laughs> yeah. Can you scoop us up some. Oh yeah, so we'll scoop it up. But uh, you know, otherwise, when it comes to any of other sort of costumes, you know, you think of all the period stuff. For the most part, it's like you can't wear most of that stuff. There's just a couple of crazy jackets and a few things that she wore in her personal life. It eats a lot. Uh, the women. Um, she wears a couple of those dresses out at events. Uh, the, the famous white dress from the final scene with the beading around the waist. Uh, she wore that to, on a couple of dates with George Rath in the, like 1940. Um, and mm -hmm. she wore, uh, I have her wearing it in New York in like 1941. So she, she, she kept a lot of those things that she could reuse. And I think she was, um, I think she was cheap. She's really cheap. You know, she knew every dime that she had. She knew where it was at, you know, what was coming in, what was going out. I have the receipts for the Hollywood Reporter that she charged back to the studio. You know, even like, you know, the trade papers, she would charge back. So everything was charged back. And here is what our final product looks like, by the way. Now my kid can eat it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we are going to have our chocolate Antoinette and eat it. Thank you. So, served on my depression glass dishes from the 1930s. And in 1925, the Oneida Company issued a line of silent film star spoons, and Norma what? was one of the spoons. So yeah. I've got my Norma Shera spoon. And Darren has got a very special spoon. Do you have the baby spoon? Yeah, let me go grab that. Yeah. He has a baby version of the Norma Shera spoon in the original box. Mary. Yeah, so you know, Norma was such a big star at that okay, point that they would do things like a baby spoon, Norma Shear spoon. So they took that spoon and they bent the end of it, so it still has her little profile on it. And but it's so it's for feeding your baby a silver spoon on a silver spoon from Norma Shear, and it actually <laughs> still has the original Oneida Community uh, twenty-year replacement guarantee uh, little label inside. And I just this was actually an eBay purchase maybe two years ago. And it has her autograph along the, the little handle too. And it was just such a bizarre piece. I'm like, yeah, I gotta have it. <laughs> yeah. Let's take some questions too from the audience. Uh, Danny, no, you don't eat it warm. I made one last night so we could have it today cold. Uh, Benjamin, what did Norma like to eat in her personal life? Um, she ate everything. You know, she uh, was, wasn't a big, dieter which I thought was actually kind of funny and she would you know torture people around her by eating I have a feeling when she was alone she was probably a very uh, small eater you know because she is so tiny she's five foot one and any given day she's anywhere between 105 and 110 pounds so you add like five pounds to that so which during the women she she was having some issues and actually did put on a little weight during that film and she's it's probably like five pounds but she just looks fuller in that movie Oh, um, see what else we got on here. 
Uh, yeah, Marie Antoinette is when the social thing. Uh, Danny Miller, she didn't meet Martin Aroche until uh, March of 1942. So, but uh, Maria Cooper, Gary Cooper's daughter, uh, swears that they met as early as 1938 or 39. And that um, uh, Maria Cooper was actually uh, taught to ski by Martin Aroche and that he taught all the children of all the stars. So, um, nope, I didn't get a chance to speak to Jackie Cooper about Norma. I did speak to Marsha Hunt, who we're lucky enough to still have. And she yes. has just some very delightful stories about going down to the house. Uh, I spoke to Douglas Fairbanks. You know, they, they all just have really nice things to say about her. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes is Jimmy Stewart just saying, she wasn't the gal for me, but she was a hell of a lot of fun. And mm -hmm. that's what I, I keep getting from everybody is that she was just fun to be with. Um, Excellent. Not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. I think it's it's pretty tasty. Pretty real, actually. So, by the way, if any of you make this recipe, tag me. Um, hashtag Hollywood Kitchen, Norma Shearer, and it's kind of fun to share food and movies because that's, as I've said before, kind of something we can all get behind that sort of unites us all, no matter where we live or what we do. Absolutely. Most of us all love food and movies. I'm gonna get this out of the oven. Mm. Uh, Darren's going to take the, the out of the oven version out so we can see what it looks like fresh out of the oven. Oh, look at that toasted coconut. That is beautiful. Wow. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can do this. I can't tip it too much because it's really hot, but it's really hot. You guys can see it. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that Where's pretty? The, you can see the coconut. Yeah. yeah, you can definitely see the coconut there. Yeah, and the meringue and everything on is really bright. Uh, Rose, sorry. Yeah, I think it tastes really good cold, especially in the summertime. Yeah, uh, we did have it yeah. warm and it was okay. Um, I think Danny asked if uh, Norma was good with her money. She was really good with her money. She and Irving were investing in property from the minute they got married. She bought her first house in 1925. Um, she was very, uh, she knew where every dime was at. And uh, uh, going through a lot of her personal effects, I have this really great envelope that says keep it so um, in safe deposit box. And inside of it on little torn pieces of paper, she's written how much money she's made every year since she started working. Oh, and I think this ends in like 39 or 40. And, it's, and then it has a line for taxes and then charity and then how much she has left. So she like was obsessed with where her money was at and how much. And I'm sure it's coming you know, from those periods in her life when she was quite poor. Uh, which were her New York days more than anything else. And when her father went broke when she was in her early teens. Yeah, and right. I think a lot of stars, if they either, I, I find that they fall into one of two camps, either the they spend super lavishly and have absolutely no sense of money, or a lot of times they're so guarded and so careful because they remember how hard they struggled and they remember what it was like to have nothing. And they're very mm -hmm. terrified of losing that or being poor again. So they're very, very conscientious about it mm -hmm. which makes sense yeah she was um you read through her contracts and they're they're absolutely um fantastic uh she or her mother make notations on her contracts all the time and, and it's about like screen credits and about pay schedules and all that stuff that and, and i know i've read a few times where people said norma should have been a lawyer mm. and she was amazing um yeah, Kenton, I think Marie Antoinette was definitely the film that Norma was most proud of. I think she was she kept Romeo and Juliet up there on her list because it was probably her hardest achievement, honestly, you know, to do Shakespeare. Know As she said, it's just so many words. But um, you know, that that movie was definitely much closer to Irving's heart than it was to her at the end of the day. And Danny says, who are her best gal pals in Hollywood? Um Merle over. Merle Oberon. For sure. uh, my favorite gal pal, her, uh, she's really good friends with Mary Pickford, uh, but she's also really good friends with Doug Fairbanks' second wife, Sylvia. So I've got pictures of her standing between Mary Pickford and Sylvia, which I think is just the oddest, awkward, bit, awkward mm -hmm. thing. Um, but she was really Claudette Colbert. Uh, she, they were chummy with Myrna Lori. Like a lot of those ladies she was really chummy with. I feel like if they weren't a threat to her, like somebody who could take a role from her, she was good friends with them. Like she, she and Hedy Lamarr were pretty tight. 
Okay. And she goes on and on and on about how much she just adores Hedy Lamar in her autobiography. So it's pretty fascinating. Another thing I wanted to point out, you mentioned a minute ago about Norman's mom being making notations on her contract. You frequently hear about Mary Pickford's mom, Charlotte Pickford, being quite a businesswoman in her own right. But you really don't hear about Norma's mother being that way. So talk to me about oh, Norma's mom yeah. and her kind of role in shaping um you know, Norma's life, career, and trajectory. Well, I think she was like um, Lottie, Lottie Pickford. Mm -hmm. well, Lottie was the sister. Charlotte sister. was the mom. Charlotte, Charlotte, yeah, Charlotte yeah. sorry. So I think she was like Charlotte. I think she was like, um, what was Ginger Rogers' mother? Like a, a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. A lot of those ladies were. Lila Rogers. Lila, where they, <laughs> they wanted to be actors or actresses, and for whatever reason, they just weren't. And they took it out on their children. So, because uh, Norma took her hmm. daughters both to New York in 1920 and just thought they would make it a lark. And a foal, her sister, pretty much right away, just knew she wasn't cut out for it. But Norma really, like, you know, rode the ride. And her mother was with her the entire time when she came out to California, lived with her. Um, I have a photo shoot at their house in 1925 when they were living together. And um, at one point, uh, uh, her mother is Edie. Edith is wearing Norma's dresses like they, they changed dresses in the middle of the shoot wow. so I think she really emulated it but you know once Norma got married in 27 and kind of went on and had her own life Edie just kind of had her own you know she had Douglas she had a foal she had a lot of grandkids and she was a very eccentric lady so I think she was very instrumental in the early days of Norma's but by 26 27 and Irving coming on the picture she kind of you know faded into the background but she's with yeah. Norma at premieres she's with her at events yeah. You know, she took her everywhere. She's with her. Um, there's a great photo of all a bunch of the folks at the Grand Hotel premiere, and it's like Irving on one side and Edie on the other. Like that, she was always there. Okay. Yeah. Oh, what's so, the deal with Norma discovering Janet Lee? Yes, let's talk about that. Yeah, so uh, Norma's father. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you go ahead. Story, Sorry. Right? Yeah, you go ahead. Story. I know probably not as intricate as you do, but um, uh, she, her father, Janet Lee's father worked at a skiing lodge that Norma was at, and she saw her picture, Janet's picture on the desk and said, she's pretty, she's pretty enough to be in pictures. And that, you could go a little more into it than I could, but that's what I remember. <laughs> Yeah, well, Norma, Norma liked to discover people, you know, starting in 1928 when she and Irving were on their honeymoon. And it's one of the many things that I want to add to, you know, the, the layers of Norma's story that, you know, outside of the Gavin Lambert book and the Lawrence Quirk biographies. And, you know, kudos to those guys for writing biographies in the days before we had internet and had the access that we have now. So there, there's a lot of mistakes that are really easily Googleable. Google now, but we couldn't, you know, back then you just sort of took his gospel, but um, she, she and Irving discovered a, an actress named Eva von Byrne, 1928, and this was on the heels of three years earlier when Mayer had discovered Garbo, mm -hmm. and Irving, I, I was reading uh, Samuel Marx's book, and he was saying how Mayer was really good at discovering talent, because he found Greer Garson, he found like all these incredible people, but that Irving wasn't good at finding talent, but he was really good at developing it. So Norma always felt like she could sort of discover people. So she, they brought Eva, Eva von Byrne back. They did a huge promotion with her. She did one film with John Gilbert right on the cusp of sound films coming in. She basically faded away and they put her on a, on a, a boat and sent her back to Europe. And she just died just a few years ago. She lived to be like 103. Uh, and then in the thirties, wow. there was an actor that was uh, connected to her um, and he ended up becoming a radio star. I can't think of his name right offhand, but it, it was attributed to her discovering him. Although I looked him up and he had quite a filmography before that and been doing a lot of radio and stage stuff. So I think they just sort of attached her name to him and you know, his career didn't go anywhere at MGM, but he was at MGM for a hot minute. And then there's uh, Janet Lee, who, uh, you know, I think the, she stayed, Norma stayed very close with everybody at MGM and a lot of those producers stayed there well into the 60s. So I think she would drive them a little crazy and send them like, hi, I found another photo. I found this, I found that. But Janet Lee was actually mm -hmm. one who made the cut and became, you know, a, a really big star. What about Robert Evans? Yeah, Robert Evans. Robert you know, that, Evans. And yep. that was- Man of a Thousand Faces. Yeah, yeah. And that was to, to play, you know, Irving Thalberg in The Man of a Thousand play, uh, Faces. And, and they brought yeah. her in as a consultant and they really wanted 
they could have done whatever they wanted to with the movie because Irving Thalberg was technically public domain anyway, but I think they wanted to bring her in for the publicity and then the whole Robert Evans thing just added layers to it. And, you know, I met him and I got to talk to him about it and he was lovely and had, you know, great things to say about her always. Uh, Janet Lee just could not stop talking about her, just, you know, the most gorgeous creature she'd ever seen. And, you know, the, and I've got pictures of them socializing into the 60s. So Norma definitely stayed a part of her life. You know, I actually want to ask Jamie Lee Curtis about it one day. Like, do you remember Norma Shear being around? Mary. But yeah, there, there's like five or six people that I've got attributed to Norma. So, and Janet Lee and Robert Evans are definitely the two that went on to other things. Well, it sounds like even though she retired from the screen in the early 40s, she still kind of had a hand in the industry, or at least partially, you yeah, know, an oh. industry going on. Yeah. See, Norma was Hetty's favorite actress. No! The mother, yeah, so Roy Wyndham wrote a long note about Norma was Hetty's favorite actress in Austria. Hetty and her mother would go to the movies to see Norma's film. The first person Hetty introduced her mother to at MGM uh, was Norma Shearer, which I believe uh, Roy and I might have a picture of it. It was on the set of Her Cardboard Lover. Uh, so Hetty brought her mother over to meet Norma on, on the set. So it meant a lot to her. And then Barbara Boyd asked about her children. So she, they had a son, Irving Jr. in 1930, mm -hmm. and a daughter in 1935. Um, they both since have passed. He wrote away. two philosophy books. Yeah, he was. Um, he was an instructor in Ch University of Chicago. Yeah, he, and and from what I'm I'm gathering, he was kind of turning into sort of a Hollywood brat. You know, the, mm -hmm. the later 40s, which is really easy to do, and and you know he, they had all the money in the world, and and he had a like a sports car and was staying out late doing all this crazy stuff and he got drafted into the army and they they said between that and his first wife it really humanized him and he really found like who he who he became so he went to school became a what was it a um, philosophy philosophy professor and mm -hmm. he died four years after she 87 died. yeah so four years after her um which is when you look at it too, like her sister, Athol, actually died, I think in 86. So she actually, her sister outlived her. And her brother, Doug, died in 1970, I think 70 or 73, somewhere in, in that range. And he stayed at MGM. So uh, Douglas Shearer, which you see on the credits of every MGM film, that was Norma's brother. And he was brought on to set up, create the film, uh, the sound department. And he was there until I think 1966. So he was one of the last of the old guard of the department heads to be at the studio. So, and, and I'm actually doing a bit of a dive into his life and he's absolutely fascinating. Like I would love to just do a book like on the shearers in general. Oh, you should. They, they're, oh just, yes, they're just please. such a quirky family. Well, what about her daughter, Catherine Thalberg? Explore, um, explore booksellers, Aspen, Colorado, founded it. Yeah, and she did not want the limelight you know i found a couple of notations where she had screen test or she did this or did that i'm like I, I if she did i don't think her heart was in it it was probably stuff her mother was like maybe try being an actress uh so she she stayed away from limelight. Oh, except her, her second you. husband richard anderson was oscar goldman on six million dollar man so she still had connections to the business and norma loved richard anderson but he was everything that you know norma would love he was tall good looking dark looks and had been under contract to mgm i mean what more would norma want so she really dug him what, what about grandkids of norma and irving you know deborah yeah i know yeah. De I, I know deborah and she's absolutely lovely um you know the the thing with the irving jr's kids so irving jr got married and they were married for you know, i think 11 years and they had three daughters together and then they got a divorce around 1969 1970 and irving got remarried irving jr got remarried and their mother suzanne got remarried and they moved to san francisco and irving jr lived in chicago so they were basically the children of you know, the previous spouses of these folks. And Norma was here in LA. So, and Norma was still taking visitors up until about 78 or 79 at her house. And I think um, you on you know, the grandkids just didn't have much of an interaction with her on Irving's side. I think on uh, Richard Anderson's side, on Suzanne's side, they had a lot more because they lived here in town. So, and I think Norma would drop by the house. She would go visit Richard. She'd visit Suzanne, uh, uh, yeah, visit, um, not Suzanne, uh, Katie. 
Katie, as she was called by everybody. And uh, they had they had much more of an interaction, but they, they're not like the closest knit family, but uh, you know, a lot of families just aren't, especially if you, one moves to San Francisco and the other one moves to Chicago. That's a long yeah. way. That is. Yeah, but no, their they're fa- their family is absolutely just fascinating. Douglas had two kids. They had a son, um, Stephen, who changed his name to Stefan in 1935, and they had a son named Mark in 1937. Mark. And yep. Mark's the one that I've been in touch with, and he, he's absolutely wonderful. He has some great insight into the in you know just the family, and he can describe the beach house down to the T, down to the colors of the walls and the play, you know, the playrooms, and just, it's fascinating to listen to him talk about it, and he would go to Katie's Hollywood kid parties, and it would be all the children of Hollywood stars down at the beach having, you know, they bring in a merry-go-round, and, you know, clowns, they do all those things that people who are affluent in the 40s could do, so, yeah, they, they, they all had a good life. And Athol, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, her sister was married to Howard Hawks for mm-hmm. a time being. So what, what is Athol's story? Um, so Athol always had, um, which has been pretty much documented, she always had mental issues. You know, she would, and I think she was probably bipolar long before people knew what bipolar was because she would have yeah. really great periods and then really dark periods. So she uh, and Norma moved to New York in 1920. They moved back to Canada briefly, and then they stayed in New York until 23. Um, Athol married an extra on a, uh, from a movie set, and they got married, and they moved uh, to uh, Greenwich Village. And Norma and her mother moved to Greenwich Village to be near them for the, the early part of 23. And then Norma got her contract, so she and her sister, or she and her mother, took the train out here and uh, got a place in Hollywood. And then Thole divorced her husband in 25, came out with their son, I think his name was Richard. And then in 27, she met Howard Hawks, married him. They had Barbara and David together who are both still alive. Barbara lives in Palm Springs, David lives right here in Sherman Oaks. And they got a divorce in 1940. And Howard was, you know, an incredible filmmaker, but just a son of a bitch. Like he just cheated on her and yeah. just, you know, he was a man's man and he was a drinker and just everything that somebody who is not the most mentally balanced would be able to handle. So mm-hmm. the, they divorced in 1940. Norma and her mother actually had to go to court on her behalf and, and you know, they did a proxy divorce. And Athol um, lived in their home in the late 40s and in the 50s. She had to sue Howard a number of times for back alimony and for money. And from what I could tell, she got it. In fairness, he sounds like he would have been a nightmare for any woman as a partner. Well, you know, and <laughs> yeah, Slim sure. Hawks, you know, who was sort of his, his muse, you know, mm-hmm. she, they got a divorce. Like he, he was married, I think, four or five times and was just, you know, just not husband material, yeah. you know, in that, in that regard. So Athol lived into the 60s, 70s. Norma writes about her in some letters that, she, you know, she put her up in an apartment and they were still in touch with each other. And then she ended up dying in a retirement home uh, out in, uh, in the Valley in 86. I double checked to see if it was a motion picture country home and it wasn't. So um, she had like a, a pretty up and down life. You know, it's pretty sad to have mental issues in that time when people didn't address them and didn't have the chemicals or the means or anything, tools. the tools, yeah, anything Any to be able to help these folks along. So she would have been that, you know, crazy aunt or sister that a lot of people would have just put in the attic. But, you know, Norma, Norma just absolutely adored the thought. She loved her brother and her sister and just raves about them too. So, oh, and Danny Miller wants to know, do you have a, a lot of my no- Norma posters on uh, display? Um, yeah. You want to take the laptop around the apartment? Um, we could, if you want to see real quick. Could? Yeah. Sure. So I've got a couple pieces in hanging here. This is my, my Belgian Riptide one sheet, which I love because it actually has the original title of the film, which was Lady Mary's Lovers, which is one of the many working titles while it was coming up. And then I've also got, um, the women one sheet and the smile and through one sheet. So, and, and the women one sheet was actually one of the last ones I ever got because it just was always so expensive, but it seemed to be in every auction. So I'm like, I'm not in a hurry to get it. Doesn't seem like it's that rare. And that smile and through one just came up a couple of years ago, went for an outrageous amount. And then somebody re- like put it into another auction and I got it for like a, a, a reasonable price. Can you the actress? Yeah. That's a lost silent, right? Yeah. And then I've got... Okay. This is kind of buried behind my filing cabinet, but this is the actress. 
Australian daybill and it's really beautiful. So, and this right here of all, uh, all things, this is huge, huge scrapbook I just got not too long ago. That was Leslie Howard's personal scrapbook from the thirties. Oh my God. Yeah. Mary Jane Sinclair would love that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fantastic. <laughs> It's got all this, it's got his autograph in there a million times and letters and notes from MGM. And it talks about Hamlet that he went to do after Romeo and Juliet. Like it's got a ton of stuff in there. Um, and I've got, oh, and, and Jack was asking too, because I've got a signed photo. I, I love when I can find a photo from or to Norma Shearer that are signed by somebody famous. So uh, a couple years back, I got a photo of Norma that she autographed to Ida Coverman, who was Louis B. Mayer's secretary and the one that like knew everything. So I've had that one for a little while. I just got one maybe six months ago, the Wallace Ford that she signed to him. And it was basically like to Wallace Ford, you're a very good actor, you know, love Norma. Cause when people would come to MGM, that would be the first thing they would do was they would get photos of all the, the stars that were on the lot signed to them and they'd hang them in their dressing room. So you see pictures after pictures of Jean Harlow and Norma and, pretty much everybody down the row, um, W.S. Van Dyke, you know, all the directors, they would get these photos and decorate their walls with all the stars. I have one from um, Lou Cody, who was a silent star, to Eva Von Byrne, which I just had to get just because of the connection. And, you know, cause she was there for a minute. So they must've given her a dressing room and really set her up, but it's kind of crazy. Oh, I know, Danny. No, you're not gonna break in, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> So I, they have a concierge downstairs, so it would yeah. be very hard to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I do have a lot of free sheets. I have uh, both for Escape, We Were Dancing, all the later titles. I have uh, the women three sheet. Um, I'm trying to think, I've got. A, He's got a poster table. Where yeah, you I've got have a poster trays. table. So I've got a, a lot of uh, Romeo and Juliet three sheet, um, both the Idiots Delight three sheets. I've got a bunch of those. I turned down um, a Marie Antoinette three sheet years ago because it was too expensive. And then the guy uh, discounted it to half price. It was $1,500 and I was like, no way. And he went to 750 and I was like, I still can't afford it. And then a friend of mine said, I was talking to her about it over dinner and she goes, well, if you want that, I will, I will do it for half. And it had been sitting on eBay for like months and I got home and it was before we could do it on our phone, got home, logged on and it sold like that day. So I'm like, I, I will get it one day. It's just one of those bittersweet, like, oh, I could have had the ranch for that three sheet. Oh, Danny's saying something about future Norma Museum. Well, yes. there is a Norma Museum, actually, and it's not here, although this is that as well. Tell yeah. us about the Norma Museum. So I got approached by the Marie Dressler Museum, which is in Coburg, uh, Canada, which is north of Toronto. It's about 45 minutes, hour north. And they have the Marie Dressler home, which was her childhood home. So they are opening a Norma Shear wing. They're going to do Norma Shear and a Mary Pickford wing. So I am uh, curating and giving them all of the supplies for uh, the um, all the photos, all the ephemera, everything for the Norma Shear exhibit. And they've been just over the moon, you know, the, the fact that they're so willing to share everything with them. I think we need to go up there for a ribbon cutting or some sort of dedication or something. Break, oh, yeah. the, break the champagne bottle on the front door of the museum, something yeah. like that. Yeah, it, right? would, it would have been November of last year, but of course that didn't wow. happen. And then they pushed it to June of this year, but they're going to push it again probably to June of next year to have the actual okay. opening. And I want to take, um, of course, who Collins with me, who played Norma mm. as a child and smiling through. And uh, I was, you know, I reached out to a couple of members of the family and to uh, Marilyn Knowles, who played Norma's daughter in Marie Antoinette. And, you know, she has lovely stories to say and try, try to get a group of people together to actually go to this event to actually oh, have this. Fun. And it'll be a, a permanent exhibit. They, they want to actually grow it into famous Canadians. And they said the next exhibit they want to do is actually Douglas Shear, which I think is actually really Ooh, cool. Yeah, you could help curate that as well. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they've been... <laughs> They've been absolutely wonderful to, to work with though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions, anybody? Last call. I think you're gonna have to stop a lot of TCM fans from breaking into your building. So on yeah. the way out today, you might wanna stop and tell the- <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I will definitely tell the doorman. <laughs> uh, have to up your security, man. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, well, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and she clicks on Marlene.
And we were talking about how, you know, we, we love the posters, we love the lobby cards, we love the ephemera, but now we're, we're at that point in collecting and she's been collecting almost as long as I have, but we really want like the personal stuff. Like we want the notes, we want the, you know, the, I, I've got a, a one enormous compacts. It's got a tiny bit of that Silverstone number one left in the bottom. Um, I've got Irving Thalberg's botch that was given to him by Norma Talmadge. Like I've got all this crazy, oh crazy stuff, but there's so many things that I've passed over the years. I have a, a loving cup that was given to her by the ambassador of Mexico for the good neighbor plan in 1941. So I have a picture mm -hmm. of me handing it to her uh, and with um, Jock Whitney, because she was she actually dated Jock Whitney for a hot minute who financed Gone with the Wind and David Selznick were behind her in the photo. So I love all the, 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 the real personal effects. So yeah, the, yeah, Barbara says the personal items are so special. They really are. You know, when they had a Norma auction about 10 years ago, um, there was a box of just stuff and people were going crazy over her personal clothing. They were going crazy. All over, and I'm like, I want this box of stuff. It had her, um, the actual yeah. contract that Mary Pickford wrote up to bring Irving Thalberg over to United Artists. Like, I never knew it got that far. So the contract, and it just had all this weird, like, notes with her and her mom and her sister. And they didn't really mean anything in the whole scheme of stuff. So I, um, I got out visited, uh, outbid on this box. I was so angry about it, but I was also buying my home. And I'm like, I either want home or I want this box. <laughs> so then I found the guy who bought the box and he wanted, it sold for $6,000 and he wanted fifteen. dollars and I'm like, now you're just insulting. Like, I'm not going to do it. So bit by bit, he sold me bar parts of the box. I'm like, at least I won't feel quite as bad buying it. And then God got it if he didn't die. And I don't know where the rest of it was. So. <laughs> but I, I did get um, a ton of letters between him and, uh, or between Norma and Irving Jr. that really give insight into the family and their relationships that were pretty fascinating. And then um, all of Norma's letters to her mother because she had put her mother in, um, they called it an asylum, but her mother had had um, maybe some drinking issues, maybe some, you know, there'd been rumors about it. And I, I don't ever want to be somebody who's going to substantiate rumors, but she did go into the Garden Grove Sanitarium, which is what that's primarily for. So she wrote her a lot of letters. And um, so I've got all the, she got all the letters back that she'd written her mother that her mother had saved. And it's like, I'm so sorry I can't come to visit you. Uh, here's a beautiful nightgown for you. I'm sorry I didn't see you over the holidays. We were in San Moritz. I'm so sorry you're there. You know, she's, Norma's feeling very guilty and is, spends a lot of time apologizing to her for being there, but she also won't visit her, which she's probably having a hard time facing that in her mother. And, you know, that's what I can sort of extract from these letters. But, you know, in writing the book, that's, it's been like the painful part of trying to write. I'm so close to her and I don't want to get things wrong and I don't want to guess, you know, and, and, and I hate it when somebody says, well, and then she did this movie and she was really depressed that she did this movie and she felt this way and she felt that way. And I'm like, but did she? Like, you know I, that? I, don't, yeah. I don't know how she felt, you know, or, or when they recount conversations, I'm like, I wasn't in the room and both people have been dead for 40 years. So I, I really want to have a, a super accurate record of her life and all of the great stuff that she did in her life. And, you know, she may have retired, but she never stopped being a movie actress. She was a, a star up until the very end. She traveled the world and she had money, she had beauty, she had fame. And I was talking to, I think I was talking to Ruth about this. Uh, hey, Ruth. Who's on. Um, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, people still knew who Norma was. And she could fly into, like, Egypt and call the king of Egypt and be like, hi, I'm Norma Shearer. I want to come over for dinner. And they'd be like, please, we'll have you. You know, it was like that sort of Cary Grant thing. Like, you could just go anywhere you wanted, and they would just open a door for you. So she love to live life like that? Yeah. <laughs> So she's, you know, still beautiful. She's rich. She's famous. She's well known. She's got her Oscar. So I, you know, I think she just had a very uh, as and, and Maria Cooper told me that too. She said she was every time I was around Norma, she had a hell of a good time. She's always having a good time. So Jack Priest has a question that is really good. Uh, do you know if Norma ever visited the Hollywood Canteen? Not that I've ever been able to tell. So I've not seen any photos. I've never seen any notations about it. When she married uh, Marty, mm -hmm. she became a, as she liked to call it, a military vet. So he was trained in, uh, he was trained by the same guy who trained Abel, because she arranged that. 
So she went to the South and I think it was, might have been North Carolina, I don't remember where it is. And then he ended up in Phoenix and then he was stationed outside of San Francisco where he was from. And Norma would just follow him. So if he was in San Francisco, she'd rent an apartment and she'd just go be there. So she spent her time between LA and wherever Marty was up until 1944. But she did do uh, an appearance at Radio City Music Hall. She did appearances at the Hollywood Bowl. She did a lot of Canadian war relief stuff, but the actual canteen canteen, I've, I've never, I, I would love if anybody ever has got anything Fun about size. her being there. I would love that, but the actual canteen no, I've never seen anything. And Benjamin, we'll take one final question. Uh, Benjamin's asking, do you have any sketches of the Norma costumes or photos of costume details? I have lots. <laughs> as as I, have, I bought, the closest I have is I bought a book that they have of Adrian's designs and it had Nor a Norma doll in there and then like the dresses, but no, I don't have any sketches. Yeah, so. I, I, I have her sketches. So I got a box of those. So probably about, about a dozen sketches. It doesn't have any um, samples, like claw samples. So I don't know what stuff looked like, uh, but I do have you know a few of those. I've been asked a lot about costume sketches. People are really interested in those. And I do have a lot of photos of costume details, but nothing in color. So uh, uh, it, as part of that William Grimes collection, they would like take a button up and they would like do a close-up shot of a button and oh, wow. close-ups of like the lace that they were sewing and things that you just never really see on the screen. So th those negatives are just absolutely invaluable. They're so cool to look at. And I'm thinking one day I might just put together a picture book on Marie Antoinette just with that stuff, just because it's so detailed. Well, let me ask you this. The costumes that I saw several years back at the big Irving Thalberg exhibit at the Academy here in Los Angeles, where are those costumes now? Are they at the Academy? Are they at LACMA? Like, where are they stored? Personal, do we know? Personal collections. So everything oh, that I've, wow. I've known so far. Uh, uh, a dress sold at um, the one that's out in the Valley a couple of years ago, and they had offered it to me for $10,000. And it was like the entire black gown with like the petticoats. It had everything oh on it. But I'm like, and I, but I'm like, I don't want to be the keeper of textiles. Like, the, I don't know, being the keeper of textiles is, you know, it, it had been a big investment and well, I could have pulled it off, but. As someone who collects vintage, you've got to do the lavender sachets. You've got to refresh the lavender sachets. You have to keep them in acid-free boxes, acid-free tissue paper. You've got to store them flat because yeah. if they're on a hanger, it pulls down the fabric. It's a whole process to keep, store, and maintain historic textiles. And with something that big, I'm sure it was a huge, huge dress. So the storage okay. space you would need, it's not like you can kind of gently roll it up a dress like that. There's yeah. just no way. So that would be that would be like a museum or an archive yeah. would need and, to take on something like and that. And when people have offered me, especially things that are that big and elaborate, I, I look at it, I'm like, it'd be cool to have, but I don't know where I would put it. I don't know what yeah. I would do with it. Like, I just, I, I, I don't know if I'd put the money into it to have it restored you know, to maintain it's it. It's a like, giant project. Yeah, it's just such a giant project. So there's um, a, a collector in South Korea, of all things, that has an, a number of her gowns and bought a lot of the stuff at the Debbie oh. exhibit. Wow. And you could actually contact them and they'll, they will loan them out for shows. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, was it Gene Vincent, the guy who just died? He had the yeah. show. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, what's the other one? Philadelphia has a dress. Uh, LACMA, I don't think LACMA has anything, but I, I've been slowly sort of tracking them down and making a note of, you know. So Krista, the, the Idiot's Delight dress, so I don't know if you guys saw that article that was going around online about um, your friend- That they were knockoffs. That they were knockoffs. So, which I, uh, Edith Head was very popular in the 50s and she did a, a TV show called House Party where she would go into the audience and she would, take like a very plain Jane and she would like take a scarf out of her purse, tie it around her waist, put a little lipstick on her, fluff her hair and just do these makeovers in the audience. And Edith became like this like sensation rage and she was on all the talk shows and she did all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So one of the projects she did was uh, create, create or get together all of her favorite costumes from her favorite designers from her favorite films. So, and at that point in 56, 57, 58, like you could just call MGM costume department and they would have sketches and everything on file. Imagine. So, so she recreated a, a dress from Queen Christina. She recreated an Idiot's Delight dress. And then she did a couple of her own and she did like, a tra you know, Travis Banton. And she kind of did this whole tribute thing. And this tour, this whole costume tour went around the country. 
And there was multiple yeah. of each one made and they would show up at like, you know, shopping malls or your, you know, like a Bullock's Wilshire or wherever they would show up. So these costumes right. have been passed around and people are like, this is original Idiot's Delight costume. And I'm like, it, it's the original design. You know, I, I, I just don't think it's necessarily the original gown. But what Adrian's estate have to say about that though? So uh, they don't really yeah. have a comment about it, so. That says a lot yeah, right I didn't there. end up going, but um, Annette Ponacek did the um, introduction and stuff for it. So yeah, and it, and it she, is really—I mean, it, it's the original designs. They probably even got the original material. Like it's probably really easy for them to just be like, "Hey, do you have bolts of this, whatever?" Because I'm sure they kept, you know, little uh, what's swatches. It? Swatches. They kept mm -hmm. swatches, like you know, or you know, what was the color of this dress probably you know it's probably just said yellow so they just grabbed yellow so you know so when you look at them they like kind of look like it but then you start to dissect them and you're like i don't know about that material i don't know about that color so you know and norma loved yellow everything was yellow so why so i wear this yellow apron yeah, so there you go and whenever she wears white <laughs> on screen that's generally yellow and it just reads that way so yeah, anything else? That's it. Well, it's about um, <laughs> it's about time to wrap up. So, oh, yeah. Krista, do you have any final thoughts or anything you want to say before we log off today? Anybody would like to um, know information on Norma? Follow Darren's page. Um, Norma Share the Ultimate Star. That's where and I get your page. Yes, please. Yes, and my group, which is he is an admin of there, and I make sure that. If I don't know something, I go with Darren. <laughs> it's Norma Sheer Devotees on yeah. Facebook. It's a group. Absolutely. You're more than welcome. There is a bunch of people from all over the world, Australia, so much stuff. And it's so neat that they all just want to keep her memory alive. That's, I really that's why I love that group. They like them. And, and so. we want to thank, thank Carrie for having us on three times. Yeah. So I think Three everybody's probably times. had enough of Norma for a while, but we also wanted to get a recipe where we could get it right. Yeah, so that I was feel a, like we got it right. That was a big part of the impetus behind this. The third time needed to be the charm. Yes. So I think it was. I think it was. As evidenced by our empty depression glass bowls, which we ate out of. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's it for now. So you guys have a great day and Thank you so yeah, much. Follow thank us on Facebook. You me. <laughs> Krista, thank you, Darren. If you make this, tag me and hashtag me and all that good stuff. Yeah. And thank you all so much. I can't tell you how much it means to me to have you guys supporting this and having fun with me here. And we're just all about food, friendship, film history, and fun. So please join us in the weeks ahead for more episodes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.